The Great Lakes. When they're calm and placid, they offer smooth sailing. The day before, it was a balmy Indian summer day, if you will. But when certain weather conditions form, it can be a nightmare for mariners. The waves, we're told, were monsters. The biggest Great Lakes storm in recorded history started a nightmare 100 years ago on November 7, 1913. They had every opportunity to stop, and ships bigger than them actually did that. And that, that's what happened in the Great Storm. A storm combining Arctic air and southern moisture that didn't get the attention it deserved. But it was common in those days to sort of hang your overcoat over top of the barometer and kind of ignore it. Crushing waves, heavy ice on deck, rudders snapping, and ships rolling. So it must have seemed what could have been minutes must have seemed like hours on end for them, just fighting, knowing that they were fighting a losing, a losing battle. One stretch of Ontario shoreline witnessed horrors that cannot be forgotten. Well, there were bodies from several ships, the Carruthers, the McGeehan, the Wexford, the Hydrus, I think, further north. Even after so much time, honor and respect for the souls lost on the lakes. We're a seafaring port for one thing, and so many people died. You know, there was anywhere up to 270 or more people died in this storm, so they, they've got to be remembered. There's a lakeshore town still committed to telling the story. An event like that needs to be remembered. It really needs to be remembered, and, uh, and we're trying our best. The Great Storm of 1913 a 100-year tale. Mariners know that November on the Great Lakes means storms. They knew that in 1913, but what they didn't know about this storm resulted in a horrific and deadly four days like no one's seen since. When 12 ships vanish in one weekend and 250 sailors die, it just will never be equal on the lakes. And it all began innocently enough. It was actually a two series of storms that came in and that's why many of the captains were actually caught off guard because it came in and then went quiet for a little while. Here's the situation based on weather maps from 1913. On November 6th, strong winds out of the southwest developed as an arctic shot of cold air moved south toward the Great Lakes. On Friday, November 7th, the winds intensified across Lakes Superior and Michigan. The winds shifted on those lakes on Saturday the 8th, but Lake Huron actually became more settled. But a system to the south merged with the storm, and this was no ordinary November gale. The backside of the superstorm produced hurricane force winds on Lake Huron on Sunday the 9th and on to Lake Erie on Monday the 10th. Add blinding snow to the waves on those lakes and it earned its nickname, the White Hurricane. But the first losses came early on Lake Michigan. The Louisiana was pushed ashore south of Escanaba. They may have been okay if it weren't for the next unlucky event. But all of a sudden the ship caught fire. They don't know why, but it was between decks. So here they were trapped next to another ship, the Halstead, and uh, the fire starts burning and they have to go ashore. And then they have to go through the snow and this, you know, all this, this weather that came in and try to find some kind of a, a safe haven there. The Plymouth was not too far away but in trouble too, being towed by a tug. The tug can't pull them anymore. The boiler was underpowered. So this, they had to tell them, let's drop anchor, signal them through the horn. And these seven guys are just, you know, I can only imagine the horror on their face when they have to drop anchor and they cut them loose and leave them there. The Plymouth's captain washed ashore all the way down in Muskegon. Two others from the ship were found on shore at Manistee and Leland. The location of the ship itself remains a mystery 100 years later. In northern Lake Superior, the Lee Field succumbed to the waves, taking 18 souls with it offshore of Marquette. The Henry B. Smith, loaded with late season iron ore and 25 crew members, was in a hurry. Captain Jimmy Owen on the H.B. Smith, it was documented that he had been late all season. They basically had his job on the line, and that's when he told the people at the dock, and everybody said he was screaming about getting the cargo in. It, it's frozen, and you've got to get into my ship. i got to get out of here. And when he left, he didn't have any of his tarpaulins over his hatches. So he only made it 20 miles out of Marquette and vanished in a snow squall. They saw his lights disappear. Pride, profit, and perhaps bad weather forecasting 
would kill about 50 people on Lakes Michigan and Superior. Some captains made a really bad call. There were storm flags flying that basically told them, don't go out, it's not safe to go out, and they sailed right past them. Some ships made it through Lake Superior, thinking a November gale had spared them. The Hydrus, with its 22 crew members, the 550-foot James Carruthers, which was the biggest ship built in Canada at the time, with its crew of 22, and the Wexford, with 20 on board. They thought that they escaped the storm, but they only went through one part of it, so a lot of those guys actually went through two parts of this great storm. And round two of the monster storm of 1913 was as brutal as nature gets, as oblivious crews on Lake Huron were about to find out.